Hi, everyone. Um, my name, welcome, and welcome to everyone that's out there to the third and final panel of our Fulbright Global Webinar Series, Unmasking Inequalities, Indigenous Pathways in the Time of COVID. I'm Jeremy Gaman sperling and I'm the Fulbright Diversity Inclusion Liaison for programs in the Western Hemisphere. Um, I'm a white man in a purple shirt with beard and glasses in front of a white wall in a maroon chair. I'm hosting this series together with my colleagues, Kelly Swayze, the Fulbright Diversity and Inclusion Liaison for East Asia and the Pacific, and Susanna Hamsha, the Fulbright Regional Diversity Coordinator for Europe and Eurasia. Unmasking Inequalities is composed of three panels that explore how the COVID pandemic is making patterns of inequality, inequity, and systemic discrimination more visible as communities worldwide are faced with the political, economic, and social implications of the virus. For all that are interested, a recording of our first two panels are available on our Unmasking Inequalities YouTube channel. Before we begin, we'd like to thank the Fulbright Commissions in Nepal and Peru and the SCA branch of the Fulbright Program for their help in recruiting panelists. Specific thanks to Valeria Benitez of the Peruvian Commission for her talents in producing our promotional material and our colleagues at ECA and the cooperating agencies that administer Fulbright for their support in promoting this panel. Now let this have some context. I come to this panel as a non-Indigenous person. As a non-Indigenous person, white, queer, Jewish, able-bodied man based in the United States, invested in justice for Indigenous communities, I recognize that I only know what I know from my experience. I also understand that being part of change requires vulnerability and compassion, seeing how struggles I experience, for example, in my queerness are connected to that of other communities, whether because of the similar yet different dynamics of oppression we experience, or in this case, in connection with other queer and trans indigenous people across the globe. As panel organizers, Kelly, Susanna, and I use being part of this conversation as an opportunity to critically listen and continue to think about how I live, how we live and act in the world as to not further the marginalization of indigenous communities in my context and to amplify indigenous voices within the resources we possess. As our panelists will also discuss, this is an opportunity to more fully grasp the diversity of what it means to be indigenous worldwide. That indigeneity is a vast and abundant network of diverse peoples, identities, and ways of knowing and being. If any of these words resonate with our listeners today, I ask you to also, also critically reflect on what brings you to this space. Now to move into a short introduction on our topic today, indigenous pathways in the time of COVID. In an article from January, 2021, the International Work Group in Indigenous Issues reported that Indigenous people in their territories were already disproportionately affected by structural inequalities before the pandemic. Environmental degradation, conflicts over resources, expropriation of land and human rights violations continue to detrimentally impact their lives. However, the pandemic has now added another layer of threats that have compounded the challenges Indigenous peoples face today." End quote. In addition to what this article lays out, the pandemic has also compounded the situation of Indigenous folks who sit at the intersection of multiple forms of oppression, as seen in increases in gender-based violence experienced by Indigenous trans and cis women, third gender and femme non-binary folks, or further in access to life-affirming resources for Indigenous people with disabilities. In response to COVID-19, Indigenous activists have called on state and corporate actors to involve them in public health planning, invoking the right of free prior informed consent, or FPIC, which is the right of Indigenous groups to give or withhold consent to a project that may affect them or their territories, and is part of the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People. With the lack of Indigenous representation in most political and economic bodies and positions, this right guarantees that efforts can be led by the community, by leaders, activists, and healers who know their people best. Unfortunately, it's been the case time and time again in pre-pandemic and now, governments and corporate actors have not honored FPIC. In a report from October 2020 by Special Rapporteur on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, Jose Francisco Calizay notes the opposite, that Indigenous peoples are rarely taken into, into account in contingency plans, end quote. Further this exclusion is the fact that most public health campaigns, information and materials are not written or broadcast in, indig in indigenous languages, or they are, nor they are designed in culturally relevant manners or due to existing issues of access ever reach the people they are meant to reach. Again, we must acknowledge this is not new. Without guaranteed and systematic support from governments and local agencies, indigenous communities have organized throughout the pandemic, both among themselves and in solidarity with other related and intersecting movements. Such responses have been highly effective at protecting, at protecting Indigenous life and connecting with other areas of Indigenous struggle, including fights for land sovereignty, 
protecting biodiversity and pursuing environmental justice, linguistic and cultural preservation, mitigating the impact of global warming and climate change. And as with the violation of indigenous rights, this level of organizing in light of crisis, state neglect and malfeasance, it's not new, but organizing the indigenous people have done time and time again. So what does the world look like when these injustices and this level of systemic exclusion are no longer reality? Arriving at such a question, we must seek new paths that center indigenous well-being and that are guided by indigenous people themselves. Today, we will hear from academics and activists who will enhance our understanding of the ways in which the COVID-19 pandemic has impacted indigenous peoples in their communities and contexts, and how they as advocates and how they as advocates and activists confront the intersecting structures of oppression that often define an indigenous life. The work and experience of our panelists provide experience that the most marginalized need to be involved in the planning and implementation of government and healthcare responses to COVID-19. We hope that listeners joining us today will find this discussion engaging and will be inspired to reflect on what we want our post-pandemic world to look like. Now, thank you all for listening to me blabber on a little bit. But without further ado, I'd like to introduce our four fantastic speakers. First, we have Dovan Rai calling in from Nepal. Dovan Rai is a researcher, writer, programmer, and designer whose research lies at the intersections of educational psychology, game design, and artificial intelligence. She is currently working as a research fellow at the Global Institute for Interdisciplinary Studies, coordinating the research group AI and Emerging Technologies for Sustainable Future. Dovan is passionate about making quality education accessible. She has worked at OLE Nepal, where she designed educational software for public schools. She was a scientist and education coordinator, coordinator at NAAMII, a research institute dedicated to doing AI research and education in Nepal. Is the co-founder of Suchab Tatari, a career counseling platform for the youth of Nepal, and also is co-creator of COVID Support Nepal, an open source community-owned multidisciplinary platform to fight the COVID-19 pandemic by making relevant information accessible. She has a PhD in computer science from Worcester Polytechnic Institute, USA, and was a recipient of the Fulbright Science and Technology PhD Scholarship. Dovan, welcome. Next, we have Victoria Kutumbushman, who's based right now in Greenland. Victoria is an Yupiak Inuit wildlife and conservation biologist raised between the vast tundra of Utqiagvik, Alaska, and the tall redwoods of Northern California. She has lived and worked across the Arctic in efforts to promote how indigenous peoples fundamentally shape Arctic biodiversity conservation, from research to management to actualizing the dreams of new protected areas. Her role in research is to challenge the colonial legacy of conservation and instead promote partnerships with indigenous communities, knowledge and governance to develop ethically conscious, culturally relevant, and fully knowledge-based conservation efforts in the Arctic. Welcome, Victoria. Next, Andre Bahami calling in from Indonesia. Andre Barahamin is a freelance journalist, community-based media specialist, and anthropologist and book author who is a clan leader with the Watunapo tribe, an indigenous community who lives on tiny islands situated in the northwest of the Pacific Ocean at the sea border between Indonesia and the Philippines. His main interests are indigenous, indigenous food sovereignty, indigenous youth media, and digital divide, and indigenous mobility on state borders. He earned his master of philosophy degree with focus on indigenous youth and traditional knowledge at Mahasarakam University, Thailand in 2013 after completing his master's in majoring anthropology at the Australian National University. His latest book, which came out in December 2019, written in Bahasa, Indonesia, explores the Indochina's region's political past and its democratic movement. The co-founder of Mawale Movement, a cultural movement started in 2005 in, no in the northern part of Sulawesi Island, promoting tradition through arts, literature, and media. Welcome, Andre. And last but certainly not least, Germani Ojeda Lurena, who is from Peru, but currently based in um, Texas in the United States. Germani Ojeda Lurena is a Quechua indigenous scholar and member of a Quechua community in the Apurimac region of Peru. Currently, he is studying in a PhD program in the Department of Spanish and Portuguese at University of Texas, Austin, with interest in the field of indigenous media response in the Andes of South America. He studies the experience of broadcasting Quechua sounds and voice through radio stations. Germani received his BA degree in journalism at the Public University of San Antonio Abad in Cusco City, Peru, where he was the president of the Association of Quechua, Aymara, and Amazonian Students. His MA degree is in social management from the Pontifical Catholic University of Peru. So again, a huge welcome to our panelists. We are now going to get into questions. So again, 
This is meant to be a dialogue and a conversation. Um, some of these questions I will direct to all panelists and some to particular ones. As again, as a dialogue, if you have a response to something that somebody has shared, just please feel free to go off mute afterwards and just continue the conversation. So the first question to all panelists in whatever order is just this. What does being indigenous or indigeneity mean to you and in your context? And how does that inform how you see yourself and your activism? So whoever would like to begin. I can go first if that's Thank you, all Victoria. Right. Yeah. Hi, everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you're calling from. Um, my name is Victoria Kutuk Bushman, and I'm originally from Alaska, but I live now in Greenland. This is an important part of sort of my uh, understanding of my indigeneity. Our peoples, Inuit, actually live in Chukotka in Russia. Alaska, Canada, and Greenland. So we spend four countries, which is uh, often a complicated part of organizing and activism because we can't particularly do anything good for all of our peoples without approaching it from an international scale. And so we end up doing a lot of international work, but we are also in extremely different uh, political contexts, we've been colonized in different ways, we speak different languages, um, both like dialects of Inuktut, our, our indigenous language, but also, of course, Danish in Greenland, English in both Canada and Alaska, and Russian in Chukotka. So my understanding of my indigeneity is that we are very much an international peoples and in that we are very engaged at the international level because this is how we assert our rights uh, to sovereignty. But there are also a lot of considerations because we have very different circumstances that we have to navigate um, as a peoples. Thank you. Uh, I would like to uh, add more with what Victoria just shared, because I came from a very small tribe at the sea border between two different countries where everything are being imposed from the capital uh, state and people in the border like us uh, left with no options. That's, that's why being an indigenous for us is, is not only about preserving the culture, it's not only about uh, preserving the knowledge. It's not only about uh, the land rights or in terms of uh, my community, it's also the rights over the ocean where this is also part of the ancestral domains that for many years in Indonesia has been ignored by the government. Seems like due to the limited of knowledge of understanding what of the indigenous people itself means. As we know that in Indonesia, um, the indigenous right is yet to be officially recognized. Uh, and as a, someone who lives in the border, I share a um, similar feeling with Victoria. Of when we cross the border, because we've been doing it for many generations, traveling to the southern part of the Philippines, uh, both countries, uh, the Philippines and Indonesia, often call us as a illegal uh, border crossers, which is, if you come, if you see from our perspective, as indigenous people, we never real, we never recognize the state borders itself in terms of dividing the people that being uh, that has been connected for many generations. That's why, for for me, it's really. It's shaped my knowledge as well, personally, to see that the state uh, border, which is amplifying the state powers of politics, also heavily impacting the indigenous uh, mobility at the state border. 
I can go next. Uh, hi, everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. And uh, I am a Quechua scholar, part of a Quechua community. Who are the Quechuas or uh, Heshuas or Quechuas? There are different names. We are in indigenous people from what is the area of the Andes, of uh, what is now, uh, now as South America. For indigenous people, we are trying to promote the name of Abiyayala, that is an ancestral name of that part of this continent of America. And Quechua people are uh, in different countries, especially in countries like Colombia, I mean nation states, Colombia, Ecuador, Peru, Bolivia, Argentina, and Chile. Uh, we have our uh, language, that is Quechua language, and uh, that is spoken for maybe more than uh, 10 million of people. It's the the most spoken indigenous languages in the continent of America, Quechua, Quechua language. But Quechua, especially uh, last centuries, uh, are considered like second class or third class citizens within their territories. Uh, in countries like, uh, or in nation states like Peru, Quechua are becoming a minority. In the past, we were the majority. Why we are becoming minority? Because uh, there is a, a permanent action or policies of homogenization uh, and trying to increase what is the mestizo people instead indigenous. A policy, a permanent policy of erasure and assimilation of indigenous people. In the use of our language, for example, the official language is Spanish. Quechua was recognized as official in 1975, but it doesn't mean that Quechua is used, for example, in the educational system, in the official system, I mean, or in public services. Last year, we are trying to promote more and more the use of our indigenous language. This situation, encourage Quechua people, especially new generations, to promote not only our language, also our culture, our knowledge, and also to be or to self-identify as Quechua people that I consider is a challenge to nation states, where it's difficult to, in I mean, in the mainstream society characterized by a systemic and historical racism and discrimination is difficult to self-identify as indigenous. But there is a new generation of Quechuas in the Andes who are, including me, who are promoting this identity of being Quechua, Quechua people. And that is, uh, that encouraged, for example, my activism as Quechua scholar, as for Eddie, uh, or for other uh, Quechuas too. Okay, I think I'm, I'm going next. Uh, hi, everyone. Um, so my name is Dovan Rai. Uh, so I belong to the Skirat community, um, an ethnic uh, indigenous ethnic group from Nepal. Uh, so um, with regards to Nepal, first, I want to say that in Nepal, like 35% of the population identify as indigenous people. Uh, and in Nepal, we call it like the, the majority of minority, you know, it's like a lot of, you know, a um, lot, um, lot of minority groups and a lot of indigenous groups. Uh, so, in, uh, so in Nepal, um, um, we're not directly uh, colonized by the Western power, though British India had a lot of influence in our politics. So it was a colon, a colon, a colonialism by proxy, but there is no direct colonialism. But what happened is like Nepal used to have, you know, a lot of like a small tribal state, like a bunch of tribal state and one a state um, which was ruled by Hindu religion, um, high caste uh, people. They, uh, there was a state expansion and this kind of uh, for them, it's called the unification of the country and um, uh, for indigenous people say that it's kind of internal colonialism, but this is how Nepal as a state was formed by uh, winning over a lot of these uh, tribal small other states. 
so this is the modern Nepal, um, but there are a lot of indigenous. Um, so for me, like I knew that I, I belonged to this indigenous community, but it didn't feel very, it was very normal. It was very normal. You know? I had a lot of other friends who belonged to other indigenous community. Uh, so for me, my how I uh, relate um, as an indigenous has been a little bit of um, interesting because um, so we are originally from the eastern hills of Nepal, uh, but we migrated to the capital city uh, where when I was five years old, um, and we are animistic people. We don't have temple or we don't have you know. The, so when we moved to the city. Uh, so we didn't build any temple or anything. So, so in our community, all our, you know, all our um, traditional activities are done in our the, the kitchen store, like three stones. So, you know, all the the, the, the rituals are performed around that, shamanism and worshiping of ancestor and, you know, the the nature and everything. But after we left our ancestral home in the village and came to the city. So we didn't get to do any of those activities. So while growing up, I was not exposed to uh, my particular cultural practices. So I knew that I'm indigenous from my last name uh, and I don't belong to the major ruling class, but there was no active ritual practices that I really relate as, you know, indigenous community. Uh, and also like uh, language, like um, we had lost our language, like my, my grandparents knew our language, but my parents didn't know our language because in our community, um, in our ethnic group, there are other like, you know, multiple other languages. So even though both of my parents are from the same, uh, ethnic group, they speak different languages. So, you know, uh, because of um, the state uh, uh, apparatus and also our own uh, situation, um, I, I had lost my language. So basically, so I grew up, you know, without my language or without any, you know, direct. Um, um, so, so for me, like this, this indigeneity has been a little, not as visceral I, in that sense, but now as I'm, you know, um, after becoming adult, to navigate the world, I'm now also reclaiming my indigenous identity. So for me, it's like more, not only about the rituals and language, but it's also about the cultural ethos and values, you know, what we brought. So when we came from village to the city, so um, we, um, we didn't have a lot of networks, so we had to support each other. So we had a lot of, you know, our ethnic community people, villagers, you know, uh, they would, when they uh, came to the city, they would stay in our place uh, to go to hospitals or to study. And, you know, so I have, uh, even though I do not have direct exposure to the ritualistic practices, I am in constant um, contact with my people, my community. And it's also about like, you know, taking care of each other because we don't have access to, you know, state or, you know, other apparatus. So we have to rely on each other. So there's a lot of this uh, collectivistic community spirit and also a lot of um, in a cultural ethos, you know, like, you know, helping each other, paying it forward and, um, you know, building more trust you know, um, you know, and also having a little bit of abundance mindset. I'm not saying that other communities don't have, but at least this is what I felt within my community. And after I was a working professional uh, uh, to navigate in the very uh, competitive, um, hyper-capitalistic world, you know, I could see that conflict in the value system, you know, like where I have to be more defensive and transactional, but whereas I was brought up to be more, I don't know, more open and more trusting. So now the way I'm embracing my indigeneity is like, I want to embrace those cultural ethos of, you know, uh, being, being more open and, you know, uh, being less transactional, let's say, you know, being more collaborative. So this is how I'm redefining my indigeneity for myself. Thank you all for sharing that. And I appreciate ending on that note of thinking about how we, how we transform be more relational than transactional. <laughs> so thank you, Govan. So a question I'd like to direct uh, right now at, at Andre is just, um, how has your community or the communities you work with responded to the risks to personal and community safety, as well as the impact on cultural practices and rituals during the course of the COVID-19 pandemic so far? Um. Thank you, Jeremy. So first, I would like to uh, start from my own community. The, we usually held our a big festive uh, every May. 
of the year. It's the start of the hunting season where it's a huge ceremony where everyone, uh, including many of us who uh, spend most of our time outside the islands, uh, will come back and join the, uh, the whole family, the whole tribe to start the hunting season. It's a very important uh, event, which last year and this year is uh, decided to be postponed. So the elders uh, decided that it's not the right time to have this kind of event because government is already uh, saying that um, mass gathering is not allowed uh, in the current time of uh, the pandemic outbreak and but for us cancelling or postponing the uh, the cultural event it's it's more about redefining of how we as a unit as a whole big family responding to this uh, pandemic in particular uh, to the other villages where they are struggling with food sovereignty because for many years since the start of since uh, mid 1970s during the military junta in indonesia our island heavily impacted with the policy of rice the rice policy of indonesia where they converted all the the indigenous people and by taking away all lands for in different for different plantations for different purposes and which is affecting the uh, ability for us to produce our own foods and since that time we are uh, struggling to mostly like many community many villages are really depending on uh, rice being uh, coming uh, coming in from the city so by this, uh, the pandemic is giving us time to redefine how we, because they are not allow any ship to come to our island. So it's, we also decided since last March, 2020, we decided to lock down the entire tribe, nine islands, the whole tribe to be locked down and we are not uh, allowing anyone, including the members of the community to be, coming in or coming out uh, from the islands. So this is the precaution of the community, of us, how we deal with the safety of the community. But during the course of the pandemic also, we learned so many things that it shows, it just enhancing uh, what we call it like uh, the public uh, public secret that we know we cannot rely on the government. They are not, uh, they will always unavailable for us every time we face a, a crisis. And the pandemic, the COVID-19 uh, pandemic really give us a platform to really show uh, not only to outsiders, but the most important thing is showing to each other that by building, rebuilding this connection with the lands, with the forest, with the ocean, with each other, from one community with another community, one, one family with another family, one clan with another clan, we show that this is the foundation, the most important foundation, how our ancestor, how we survive as a community for many generations, for hundreds of years. And this COVID-19 is, just another form of crisis testing the indigenous community how we can survive by relying only to ourselves because relying to the government totally is a big failure it shows from the start of the covid uh, outbreak in indonesia in march to, uh, 2020 until now there's like they all keep talking about what happening in the big cities but they forgot that Indonesia consisted of 7,600 more islands, where 10,000 of the islands are very remote islands. Many people live with so many limitations, no electricity, no phone signals. So 
this is the like it's it's the big stage for the indigenous community to show that yes we can survive we can uh, rely by ourselves if the government you know without the government's intervention we can survive as long as you let us manage our land manage our natural resources you know you and recognize the rights recognize the indigenous people's rights in indonesia and but my, i can say my community is very much lucky compared to many different indigenous communities in indonesia where they lost the land and then we converted as a palm oil plantations as you know indonesia is one of the biggest uh, palm oil plantation in the world supplying europe supplying north america supplying india and also where the pulp and paper industry destroying all the rain forests not only in sumatra or kalimantan but also in papua and maluku in halmahera and also how the needs of yellowfin tuna bluefin tuna and all kind of seafood industry that feeding the first world country is actually taking away the natural resources from us you know and from many indigenous uh, communities in indonesia these communities many of these communities are really struggling with how in terms of food sovereignty because it shows that relying to the governments really knocking down the community uh, capacity of uh, surviving uh, through this pandemic you can see in as i learned from the community in the one of the last five nomads groups in halmahera forest in north maluku their forest is being targeted to to be a nickel uh, nickel mining sites you know because the global trend of uh, you know saving the crisis by providing any uh, another crisis you know the electrical battery through nickel uh, nickel mining company is right now threatening the indigenous community in halmahera the tobelo dalam is now struggling with losing foods they have to keep moving deeper to the forest because the company keep encroaching and destroying the forest at the same time the government solution is to make us uh, to bring us into the civilization by taking them from their forest and resettle them into what they call the real uh, civilization so this is this is why uh, this sometimes it's not really fair to say this but uh, I, many of us joking aside that covid-19 is only shows to the indonesian government in particular that yo this is the time to recognize the indigenous people's rights in indonesia you are totally incapable you are totally uh, fail to provide us to protect us as your citizens so if you could don't if you couldn't provide us with that sense of security in terms of foods in terms of uh, health in terms of education just give us our rights and we will deal it by ourselves you know so sometimes you just need to leave us alone if you could not taking care of us just leave us alone we will deal by ourselves Thank you, Andre. Yeah, I, I guess I, I'd like to open up that question to everyone else um, and maybe I, I just continue to expand on sort of the way that COVID-19 has an impact. And really, Andre, what I'm hearing about are the, are the discussions happening within Indigenous communities about, you know, how we want to respond and think about this moment. So um, I'm going to look to Victoria. What has the discussion of COVID-19 and its impact on Indigenous communities looked like in your context, whether, you know, there are similarities to what we've just heard or other areas of, of emphasis you want to bring into this conversation. Yeah, thanks. So like I had mentioned before, we're in kind of a strange situation as Inuit because we belong to four countries and three of them at least are highly developed countries. 
but we're extremely marginalized. We live um, what people would consider quite remote from the rest of the world. There's about 180,000 of us. Um, we live in very, very small communities, um, really close to the, you know, high above the Arctic Circle. Um, we have very little infrastructure. There are only a few hospitals in the entire country of Greenland. The largest city we have in all of our homelands is the city I live in now, Nuuk, which is only 18,000 people. We're very small change, um, like we're, it's easy to forget about us, even though we belong to these very wealthy countries. Um, and we're often left um, to our own devices. We've also gone through many pandemics before as a population. Um, there are still some pandemics, uh, particularly a respiratory disease that affects our communities in Canada, which we don't usually think Canada is a place where there are rampant um, sort of diseases in small communities, but, but this is our reality. Um, we are often sort of left to our own devices and, and Corona has not really been um, an exception to that. The circumstances are a little bit different in each of our countries though. Um, Greenland as, as an island uh, has been able to completely close off its borders from the rest of the world with very limited travel. Um, and we have actually not had Corona. We've had about 20 cases in the whole country since it began, but they have all been identified in the airport. And so we live very normal lives here in Greenland. There are no restrictions. We don't have community. There, there's no currently no active cases of Corona in the country. And so we're in our own strange little bubble, but it's a very delicate bubble because we don't have the infrastructure to deal with a pandemic if it comes. We only have three, I believe, three ventilators in the entire country. So only three people can be very sick at a time. Um, we don't have hospitals in every community or even clinics in every community. And it's very difficult to travel um, because we do not have roads. You cannot walk somewhere. Um, and some of our communities are, you know, hundreds of kilometers uh, away from other communities. And so we don't have a lot of infrastructure to deal with the pandemic here. So we've been lucky so far. In Canada, they've also been able to keep it away for some time, but um, it's been tricky because uh, it's really limited travel in Canada, uh, especially in the Northern Territories where Inuit live. And this is problematic because like we can't get all of our goods and products in our own communities. Often people are going out and bringing back what they can. Um, things are very expensive in our communities, like food is very expensive. Food security, I think, has been challenged uh, by coronavirus because we, although we live very much on the land and, and many, especially in the northern communities, um, hunt and fish and and just live on those products, we have gotten used to having also things like bread, things like milk, um, common products as well. And so it can be challenging to get those products when like the airline companies are not um, flying and we don't have roads, like there are, there are no roads to take a car on. Um, and you can't just walk from one community to another either because we're on an ice sheet. Um, in Alaska, we've actually had uh, good circumstances for one of the first times in the history of our state as part of the United States, because usually we're at the very end of, of you know, the last, you know, number 59 or, you know, I mean, 49 or 50 in terms of uh, how well we're doing compared to other parts of the U.S., but we might actually be the first state in the U.S. that is fully vaccinated. So Alaska has been um, a high priority for the United States because we are small communities. It's very expensive to, to help us when we are sick because like here in Greenland, we also don't have hospitals. Um, it's very expensive to fly people, you know, thousands of kilometers to the closest big hospital that can um, help someone who, who is infected. And so the access to the vaccine and to treatment in Alaska has been very high. 
Um, so that has been a really positive part of Corona for us. So each of our regions is dealing with this very differently. Um, a thing that I have really struggled with professionally in all of this, or I think we have struggled as a society, is a lot of organizations, and with good reason, have been putting a lot of their attention into Corona, to COVID, into um, any kind of exploration of both that, but also research into how it impacts people, right? So a lot of grant giving agencies are really focused on Corona. My problem with this is that all of our other problems have not gone away. And so when we're talking about like we need to do uh, research or studies because we're worried about population of narwhal or other whales that we rely on for food, we can't get that funding because all of the funding agencies are only interested in Corona. And for us, it can be very difficult because while the rest of the world seems okay with putting everything else on hold, we are doing so much of our own work and we are so isolated compared to the rest of the world that we need, we need funding to be able to do basic things. Um, like there has been also some trouble in North Greenland where a community has not been able to hunt for approximately eight months now. They've had no income and they only get one ship a year because we have so much sea ice that there's only one barge that brings goods in an entire year and they haven't been able to find any financial help for them. And this is a small community of only 500 people in Kanak, North Greenland. And there's no solution to it, right? And, and like you had said, Andre, like we know that we can manage our resources appropriately. We know that there is food out there, but we are not legally allowed to go and obtain that because there are, there's concerns about these big charismatic species being under threat of climate change and biodiversity loss. But on that point as well, like our communities are very in tune with these things and our knowledge is very capable of helping us to manage these resources if we are given the power to do so. Um, but that has not been the case. Another thing that I think is really tricky is um, our countries that sort of own our regions are the ones that are supposed to be helping us to get access to the vaccine, access to things like that. Here in Greenland, we're technically a part of the Danish kingdom and it is Denmark's responsibility to supply us with the vaccine. We're only 60,000 people. It's something that they could do like this, instantaneously protect an entire country, but they're not interested in giving us the vaccine. They're more concerned with vaccinating their own people within Denmark first. And this is where like, we're part of your country and we are citizens of your country but you're not treating us with equality. You're, you're, you're putting us on the back burner. And that I think has been really difficult for a lot of people because we, we don't have the vaccine here and we can't travel and we are sort of, we're confined to, to our country right now um, and probably will be for at least another year. Um, but yeah, thank you. Thank you, Victoria. Um, just opening it up to Hermani or Dovan, if you have anything you'd like to add just to the responses we've heard so far in assessing and thinking about um, how COVID-19 so far has impacted Indigenous communities during the pandemic and sort of your experience. Hey, you can go, Jeremy, just to mention that uh, if we review, for example, international news about the most impacted countries in the world, the most impacted nation in the world with COVID-19, the my country Peru is in the in the within the five countries that has been impacted more with COVID-19, and Peru is a country that has 47 indigenous peoples, different indigenous people with different languages, 47. Uh, one of them is Quechua and Quechua people. He has to mention that the, this COVID pandemic uh, impacted a lot indigenous people, especially in the Andes and the Amazonia, because we don't have the, health, the, the appropriate health service. 
we don't have the appropriate, uh, for example, hospitals or health centers. Uh, my country is a very centralized country. Like, uh, for example, Andrew was mentioning, everything is in Lima, the capital. Services, uh, ho hospital, specialized hospitals. But uh, outside Lima, it's, uh, we don't have that, that kind of service, for example. It impacted, for example, the Amazonia, where, uh, are, where we have different uh, indigenous communities. Uh, especially there are uh, regions like Loreto in, in Peru that has been impacted with uh, COVID, uh, especially last year. But now, again, this, the second wave of COVID-19 is impacting, impacting more than last year, for example, to this part of the country. And uh, now the per Peruvian government uh, is beginning with the vaccination recently. Uh, it began in February. Now, this week, we are beginning vaccinating the older than 80s. It, it, it means that you can see we are uh, maybe we have 1.5 percent of our population with a full with fully vaccination but only two percent or less than three percent with one dose with one shot of the vaccination it uh, affected a lot because after one year of the pandemic we don't have uh, we don't prepare it, we don't know how to respond to this pandemic. Many things happen during this, uh, this time, for example, internal migration. That means that thousands of people, especially Andean indigenous, I mean Quechua's, migrated uh, from Lima, the capital city, or from other large cities to their communities. Because in, in cities like Lima, thousands of people lost their jobs. Because quarantine. In countries like Peru, where the informal economy is more than 70%, if there is a quarantine, thousands of people, thousands and thousands will lose their jobs. That affected a lot the indigenous people who decided to to go back to their communities. Thank you. Yes, yes, to mention that in general about Peru. Yeah. Um, thank so, you for sharing that. Yeah. So in case of Nepal, um, yeah, I mean Nepal is one of the poorest countries. So I mean and. It's coincidentally, we also happen to have one of the most inept government, irresponsible government right now, even though it was democratically uh, elected, but uh, it has, you know, um, it is not democratic at all. Um, so there's actually um, protest movement happening against our, our government. So we are in a really tricky situation. Um, so, and we already had a very dysfunctional um, healthcare system. Um, so, so as I said, like in Nepal, like we, we are this like, you know, major to minorities, 35% people are um, from the indigenous community. And even among the <clears throat> uh, the Hindu Hindu majority, there's like a Dalis, the, 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 the untouchables. And also we have uh, people on the, the Southern part, uh, which are linguistically different. And they are also treated as second class citizens. So we have like a marginalization in different ways. And as Andre and Jer Germani also mentioned, Nepal is a very highly centralized country. Everything is in the capital city, Kathmandu. There's a lot of uh, marginalization based on the reason as well. Uh, so, but what happens, like this is a class, ethnicity, uh, language, a regional uh, marginalization is happening, but yeah, of course, indigenous people also happen, you know, normally happen to live in the remote part of the area, away from the center with different languages, and they also happen to from the lower class. So in this way, like indigenous people are suffering a lot, uh, but it's not only the indigenous people, like, you know, majority of the Nepali people are suffering. Um, and it's only a very small fraction of uh, the ruling majority who happen to be, you know, uh, have access to the state apparatus. They are kind 
kind of like uh, enjoying this disproportionate access. So if they get sick, you know, I mean, even now the vaccine, um, as a vaccine is being distributed, but there's a lot of nepotism, you know, there's a lot of backdoor uh, distribution happening. Uh, and also the vaccine vaccines is only being distributed in the capital city. And also, you know, um, and I have heard that actually the vaccine is being delivered in people's homes, you know, so and uh, the, the level of nepotism and this is kind of like, you know, I mean, uh, it's, 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 it's mind, mind blowing. I mean, and then. Um, so uh, so there is a lot of confluence of, you know, our historical uh, marginalization layered on with this very um, profit uh, oriented healthcare system layered with our particular situation of having this misfortune of this very autocratic, uh, you know, uh, government right now. And um, also there is some kind of like a backlash against this uh, indigenous movement uh, in some ways, kind of this, this way to undermine their issues. Uh, so, so yeah, we, we are really at a very, um, yeah, crucial stage. And, yeah. and Dovan, just because I think this question is important, I hear this in a lot of what everyone's saying. Um, could you expand a little bit on, on how a framework of intersectionality helps us under, understand mm -hmm. the way that COVID-19, the pandemic, um, has intensified mm -hmm. these intersecting inequalities that Indigenous community members have faced? Yeah, uh, thank you for this question, right? So I feel like Nepal is kind of, um, maybe everybody feels, but I feel, really feel like Nepal is kind of this like very laboratory situation because we have so many. So we have like 123 uh, languages alone. Um, and we are this very poor country, limited resources. And even to, you know, disseminate information, uh, um, it's not only lack of resources, but also the, you know, um, the will of the government, you know, um, uh, because the information is not being disseminated in different languages and also, um, and uh, our government state apparatus is right now used more as a state propaganda, you know, defending the government rather than um, um, reaching out to people. And in terms of intersectionality, as I mentioned, like we have, there's this like a marginalized based on ethnicity, reason, um, untouchability, even into the Hindu, Hindu majority. And also like uh, we have this whole, uh, almost 30% people living on the plains, uh, you know, Southern border and next to India, which are uh, culturally uh, similar to Indian people. And Nepal, Nepali, uh, the, 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 the ruling majority kind of distrust have this very violent distrust towards them. So there's another marginal happening there. But and even within the indigenous community, so there is like a you know, different um, intersectionality. For example, there's this one community which are from the capital city, right? They are linguistically marginalized, but because they are uh, from this, they are indigenous to the capital city. So uh, they, have, they are having good healthcare access. And there's another uh, community which lives on the periphery of this capital city, even though they are so close to the periphery, but they have been very exploited. Uh, one of the most exploited groups uh, we call them Tamangs, and they are they you they are the the they mostly are in the daily labors and everything. So right now they are one of the worst hit people of this pandemic because they rely on the daily wage labor and because of the lockdown and everything. So they are um, so one of the worst hit people. So even within this capital, you know, who, who are in the center versus who are in the periphery, there is we can see that dynamic dynamics. And also, like there are some indigenous people, right? Who uh, who had, um, you know, they they were recruited in the Gorkha army in British Brit UK. So they were able to have some middle class, you know, up one uh, portion of those people had middle class status. Um, they could get into this, you know, upgrade themselves into this like a middle class in Nepal. I also belong to that group. Uh, so what happens is like, um, so that um, whatever little, um, you know, resources we got from the foreign empl employment, we're able to distribute among the, ourselves. So we are <clears throat> a little, 
um, protected from other um, ethnicities. For example, we have called Tarus, which are on the, 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 they are also reasonably remote and they didn't have access to this foreign employment. And they were like really uh, subjugated. And they're again, one of the worst hit people of the pandemic. So, um, and, um, and as I said, like um, the people who are in the capital city, like for example, I, I am in the capital city, right? So I, I got vaccine, even though I am, you know, from this indigenous minority, but uh, the people on the, you know, remote area. So, so there's a lot of, a uh, lot of intersecting things. And um, so that's why we need this very, this nuanced uh, d discourse right now, because if we don't do it, then we are at the, um, the, you know, there's this this threat of falling into this backlash and you know, all that. So, so yeah. Thank you, Dovan. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, I'd like to move a little bit more just onto understanding more more specifically. You know, all of you have talked a, de a great deal about just like um, how indigenous organizing is happening in response to essentially you know government and state malfeasance or you know active marginalization or continuing marginalization of indigenous groups. Um, so, you know, a lot has been talked about. We, Of course, as we're talking here, a lot has moved online. And in that context, we've talked a great deal, um, I feel like, in discourse about this concept of the digital divide. So much of the world has begun utilizing digital resources and the internet to advance public health campaigns around COVID-19. And as many of you have mentioned, a lot of these things may not be able to always reach communities, whether because of issues of language or technology or access to technology. So. I would like to direct this question to Hermani. What has the impact of this quote unquote digital divide been on indigenous communities in your context? Um, considering, you know, the fact that also adding this in that oftentimes governments either, either actively exclude or do very little to include indigenous voices in the planning of responses, especially in these public health campaigns. Thank you, Jeremy. And one thing that I, for example, we agree as a group uh, and uh, of people belonging to indigenous communities is that government, nation state government, uh, are incapable to manage this crisis in our countries. For example, in Peru, the nation state government is uh, now is in a political crisis. For just to understand the context, for example, we are a, in a election, electoral process our second round election will be in a month and uh, the uh, candidates are gathering with their people no matter the pandemic and uh, also the government don't uh, doesn't include indigenous voices for example in the policies that they are implementing to to manage this situation. Usually in very highly centralized countries, you see, for example, people from the capital city talking about indigenous, how to help indigenous people, how to support indigenous communities. But you see those panels, you see those meetings without any indigenous representative. Or in, in Peru, what happened, for example, only the Ministry of Culture is the responsible of indigenous. It means that uh, indigenous is yes, uh, in the image of the government as culture, no people, no, no, no economy, only culture, uh, like in the history of Peru, or folklore or music, no more, that, or the image of the ancestral, right? But no, the contemporary indigenous people. That affects a lot because uh, we are still repeating the the colonial relationship, the colonial relationship that indigenous people, where indigenous people is not considered as a, an actor, as, an, uh, as a person who are uh, living currently in, in the territories. It affected a lot for sure, for example, in health services. It, it, the same happened in, in Peru, for example. The vaccination began in Lima, the capital city. This week we are beginning in regions with indigenous population but in lima it began uh, with uh, i mean with elderly people maybe 
15 days ago, but in, or a month ago, but in regions with indigenous population, we are beginning this week with the vaccination. And uh, I am from Apurima, and in my region, for example, we don't have enough uh, resources to, uh, for example, for this situation. Uh, yesterday, my, the government of my region was asking for help or support with oxygen. We don't have enough oxygen. For that reason, our people are dying. We don't have enough resources to implement, to, to improve our health services. That those, this situation, for example, uh, personally and to many indigenous leaders, is uh, inviting to think about the future. How could be our relationship in the future with a uh, government? Why here is important to think about this relationship? Because I, I consider that indigenous people should be should have more uh, autonomy in their decisions more autonomy and also more uh, resources. One thing that happened in, in Peru is uh, the centralization also uses uh, resources from regions with indigenous people to be managed from Lima. For example, my region is, in my region is the, the biggest uh, mining company, maybe one of the biggest mining company in the country, but all the resources go to Lima and it's managed from Lima and distributed from the central government. And it affects a lot for sure because it is part of uh, what indigenous people, Quechuas especially in, in Peru, are asking historically and struggling historically to have more autonomy, controlling their resources, controlling their uh, economical activities. Another thing that affected a lot and in, in my country is the, the tourism, because, uh, for example, the Andes, especially Cusco, where is the where is Machu Picchu, a very famous uh, touristic place. Now, after uh, during this pandemic, uh, it's not receiving tourists, especially international tourists. And the majority of people in, in this part of the country who are Quechuas, they work with tourism. They, uh, their activities were related to, for example, to tra transportation service, hotels, restaurants for tourists. And now they don't have any uh, other option to, to get uh, for example, money and this activity is, uh, in at least as I mentioned before, more than 70% of this activity, of this economy is not formal, it's informal. It means that indigenous people in, in Cusco, for example, or in the Andes, the majority of them work every day to survive. But with, with this pandemic, they lost this opportunity we lost this opportunity, for example, to get money every day to help our families. Yes, and government is not considering this. Usually from Lima, the decision doesn't consider the voice of indigenous people in this regard. I, I know that uh, maybe we will finish the vaccination next year. We are planning to finish next year. Imagine until next year, people, without this uh, access, without this opportunity to get money to work, for example, in tourism activities. Thank you, Jeremy. Thank you, Armani. Um, so noting and also to our panelists that we are already at 10.06, so uh, I wish this conversation could keep going on because I feel like I'm gaining a lot just from this conversation. I, I appreciate all that everyone's sharing. Um, so. I'd like to bring my next question sort of together and I'll, I'll leave this one open, but you know, um, indigenous communities, of course, and as all you, as you have all mentioned, in addition to combating COVID-19, are involved in simultaneous struggles has been mentioned in areas such as food sovereignty. We've talked about cultural and linguistic preservation, environmental justice, the talk of, of course, the, end, you know, the ongoing impact of global warming and climate change. So 
the question I have is just how have indigenous communities continued to organize and protect themselves? And what, what can we learn, especially for non-indigenous folks, what can we learn from this organizing that we need to bring into the future? So if anyone's willing to share just how indigenous communities have continued to organize against multiple struggle and the things that we need to learn to, pr to create this better future. Um, so I really open that question to anyone, um, especially if you even want to expand on something you shared already in this conversation. Uh, Jeremy, I would like to uh, please start like, so regardless so many struggles and now the, how the pandemic now still going on and what the most interesting thing for me as a member of the indigenous community and foremost as a man, what I, I've, uh, I learned so much, in particular, one important thing that I, I think is really need to be addressed, that during the pandemic, the frontliner in, the, in, in many different indigenous communities are women and the youth. We rarely see the elders can be so responsive to deal with uh, how the problems, daily problems need to be solved as soon as possible. But women in particular are leading these whole changes, the whole struggles. So I'm talking as a man. So, I mean, this is a very, uh, this is what uh, an ongoing uh, cases in many different communities. How women recaptures this moment and broke together the old knowledge of the health, for example, the traditional uh, medicine practices, uh, the skills of uh, processing foods, uh, forest foods and everything. Also mentally and psychologically, women are uh, the, the core of uh, keeping the community united in the, in the most difficult time. And as an, as someone who has been uh, actively working with the community, I think this is also what globally we need to recognize and why we need to give a wider and broader platform to indigenous women and indigenous youth to step ahead and you know, to share their experiences. Because COVID-19 shows that many leaderships, many male leadership, spectacularly fail to face the crisis. And women and youth are the one who, without ever being asked to step forward, they voluntarily step forward to, to save the community, to protect the family, to, to be the frontliner of defending the land, defending the ocean, the natural resources and everything. So I think, for many years, we've been ignoring the voice of indigenous women and indigenous youth for many reasons, for so many reasons. And we often see the face of indigenous struggle all over the world dominated by men. So I think this is the time to, to give those who really fight with their uh, best efforts to talk, to share, to show to the world that this is how the indigenous community deal with the pandemic. And for those who are not indigenous people and how they can involve, I think you can start uh, from the very simple things. I mean, start questioning yourself. For example, during this pandemic, uh, ordering food becomes somehow uh, a common standard for everyone in quarantine without knowing it you are forcing the high activities, you are driving this kind of uh, ordering foods, uh, things that happening all over the cities. In my community, what we, we watch is, it, it drives uh, the companies to hunt more 
to extract more the tuna, in particular the yellowfin and bluefin tuna from our ocean. They are taking away a lot of fishes because they need to uh, provide foods to people in the city. So I think you can start from your own plate. No? You can start questioning where it came from. Is it fair? Is it, uh, do you have your food by the, with a just practice or you have it from, you know, unfair treatment to the indigenous people, destructive activities against the natural resources and everything. Starting by questioning your foods, I think it will open a further discussion for, between the indigenous people and the non-indigenous people who live in the city in particular on how we can solve this problem together. We are not saying that indigenous people is the only savior, no. We also make our own mistakes. We fail for many times. But if you starting to, you know, open your questions and then start uh, looking deep, we may can start our conversation. This is the, that we need to do. Without, you know, we don't have to wait for the government. We don't have to wait for the, you know, agency or everything. We, we need you to start opening, uh, bridging yourself with us, you know, because we are, we are isolated. We cannot go out and reach you. You are the one with the whole facility, the whole privilege. You are the one that's supposed to come, bridging yourself and talk with us. That's all. Thank you. Thank you, Andre. Um, others, if you'd like to contribute to that question again about what organizing has looked like and of course what you feel is important for us to learn from the indigenous organizing. I can go, Jeremy. And thank you, Andrew. You are uh, pointing out very important things. Uh, for the future, I consider that indigenous people shouldn't wait from government. It means that we should continue working in contribution to what uh, we name as more autonomy or more self-determination. That is very important. One thing that I consider very important is that indigenous people shouldn't wait from government. If now the pandemic, for example, in Latin American countries, especially in Peru, has demonstrated that the government is in crisis in this kind of situation, is not capable to help, to support indigenous people in this kind of situation. The second thing that I consider for the future, from my perspective as indigenous, is that we should invest in our communities more in education, especially during this pandemic in Peru, for example, uh, we struggled with uh, education of our children, of our kids, we don't have the access, for example, to internet services. We don't have access. The government decided to continue the education through radio stations and TV stations. But even in our areas, we don't have access to TV stations. Also with the radio, with radio signal, we have problems. Uh, the name in Spanish of the program to continue this education was Aprendo en Casa, I learned at home. And as a response from indigenous people from the Andes was, for example, the phrase Aprendo en Cerro that I learned in the mountain, at the mountain, because we don't have radio sta station sign the signal in our towns, in our villages. It means, for example, the second thing that I consider very important is within indigenous communities to invest, to pay more attention to the education. The next thing that I consider important is that uh, this situation of the pandemic is just an alert for things that could happen in the future. The climate change, for example. We know that the climate change will affect, after the pandemic, uh, the world, will impact the world. So it is an alert as indigenous people to think, how could be our reaction for the future, for future events like climate change? And one thing that I consider, and I agree totally with Andrew, is how could we support women within, in the, within our indigenous communities or within our indigenous 
organization because, for example, in the Andes, it's still common the domination against women. With my organization, uh, I am part of an organization of Quechua people. We began working with women, especially, because they need more support in the future. I think that women in our indigenous organization should be more protagonists than men. We should do that and help as well as women help and support the new generations. First, helping them and encouraging them to self-identify as indigenous, to defend our roots, to defend our origins, and helping them and supporting them, for example, with education, with new opportunities, and prepare our communities in health services, for example, for the future. As I mentioned, I think, and I will close my participation with this, that the pandemic, COVID-19 pandemic, is yes an alert for future events, for future events like, or impacts like climate change, for example. Thank you. I could share just really briefly some of the sure. things that have happened uh, in our homelands like we have a lot of knowledge about pandemics already and so a lot of our organizing has been especially in Canada and Alaska encouraging people to go back out onto the land um, to just leave the communities where it's less safe where there are higher cases of transmission and we are lucky to be able to do this because we are people who spend so much time on the land and most people have knowledge of how to be on the land and so people started leaving the communities to go um, to either their cabins or to go camp out, you know, you know, many kilometers away because this was how our communities have always protected ourselves from these kinds of diseases. Um, to echo a lot of what everybody else has been saying as well, like we fully recognize that our governments are not always attentive to our needs and our interests and are not capable of providing what we need when we need it. And so taking some of that um, initiative to do what we need to do for ourselves and encouraging other groups of people to also do so, I think is really important. Um, someone had mentioned traditional medicine or traditional also um, responses to these kinds of things. Um, are going to be really important as we move forward because we we obviously know how to live in our own environments. It's it's so um, innate to being um, part of an indigenous community that has a long history in a place. Like I come from somewhere where it's negative 50 degrees in the winter and just being alive is a testament to the fact that we know how to live on the land and in our landscapes and, and have always been able to keep this balance because if, if we ever tipped anything out of scale, we wouldn't survive. And we've been doing this for thousands of years. And so also having faith in indigenous communities to make decisions, um, whether it's about Corona or about um, any other kind of crisis, it's so important to recognize that we have been through these things before and we will go through these things in the future, but we have the knowledge and the tools to do it. We just need help from our government to access things like vaccinations and things like this, that we also have a human right to equal to everyone else. That's all. Thanks. Thank you, Victoria. Um, so we have about nine minutes left. Um, I do want to draw attention to a question we received in Q and A. Um, so I'm going to read it off, and I'm wondering if there, we may be able to use this also potentially as a closing. Um, but the question goes as follow, follows: uh, Greeting from the Netherlands. I'm a Fulbright ETA, which is a, for folks who know an English teaching assistant, so teaching English in the Netherlands. Originally from Oklahoma in the United States, and my question concerns accessing the traditions and celebrations of Indigenous people around the world. I'm a black woman who grew up in a state with rich indigenous heritage, but that heritage has always been neglected. I think that people think that they can restore the planet and the earth resources and communities without returning to indigenous cultures that history has neglected and often erased. 
Many of these communities understand how harmony can be reached without the expense of the people or the land. Please, if you, panelists, uh, could speak to this and also mention uh, what makes you proud to be Indigenous or what it has taught you, I would appreciate it greatly. Um, and I think what I may add on to that is just, you know, if there is just something you want to all of us to know, just sort of like a, a thought you would like to leave this panel, leave this discussion with that you would like all of us to take away. But just to repeat, um, if you could speak to just sort of uh, this tendency of folks wanting to change the world, restore the world, but not actually include Indigenous voices in that conversation, and about your relationship to being Indigenous and what you want us to leave this conversation with. So any part of that question, um, I open it up to the floor. Yeah, <clears throat> I think, uh, yeah, I, I, I can add my opinion. So uh, again, thanks so much for the question. So for me, like, um, this is the, <clears throat> so especially after this COVID pandemic, I have been thinking about, you know, like, um, so my identity as an indigenous person and indigenity. So, uh, and like uh, previously I mentioned about the, the, not just the language and rituals, but the ethos and value system and the culture. So um, for us, uh, <clears throat> so the interdependence and our inter the, 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 the deep awareness of interconnectedness is such a part of our culture uh, because we are each other's state, we are each other's bank, we are each other's hospital, you know, we rely on each other. Um, and uh, this is what I have inherited and which is I really feel proud. Uh, so much so that I'm willing to, you know, even bear some losses to embrace this ethos uh, while this very um, this very competitive capitalistic culture is telling me something else, and especially this COVID nineteen showed us that you know like uh, the way we have been looking at the world in a very um, segregated sectoral uh, compartmental uh, compartmentalized way is not only <clears throat> unsustainable it's, it's it's wrong you know it's it's also factually wrong. So for that to counter that, like we really need to, we can really embrace our this 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 awareness of interconnectedness. Um, and also, I want to add on to that because uh, I also want to because I'm a technology worker. So what is the best that the the modernity or the technology has uh, has us to give, right? Like Andrew has uh, mentioned about uh, mentioned how in this COVID, um, and we also saw on the data how um, digitalization in, has in some ways exacerbated the inequality, but it doesn't have to be right i mean it doesn't have to be so if we embrace if we interject this uh, ethos of interconnectedness in the digitalization and we use digitalization as you know uh, as a collective resource we can actually you know uh, mitigate a lot of our problems so so my uh, so my final message today is like uh, let's bring uh, the best of both worlds you know our uh, uh, with the groundedness, our appreciation for our interconnectedness, and also the 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 the, the gift of technology, and let's bring it together, and uh, and then we can create uh, this this collective uh, solution uh, for the whole world. Yeah, I just want to conclude at this point. Uh, I would like to say, but regarding the questions, it's being proud as an indigenous is not a one big jump. It's a whole uh, small process that takes a long, lot of energy, efforts, and times. It's not very easy as well for me, who's being uh, someone who being educated, being taught with Western style. To, to be able to come out and embrace my identity, my roots. It's a whole different struggle internally for me. And it's also about how the community also uh, feeding and reshaping my knowledge when I uh, go back to uh, my community. Somehow for me, just like my elders always often say, we all belong to a home. You just need to find your way back home and then you will figure out how to, to defend your own home, your own place. Because those who keep destroying things because they disconnected from their home. 
you just need to find your way back home and uh, by acknowledging that uh, that you belongs to something you belongs to uh, to anything it will help you to to embrace that this is the only planet that we have you know you are not belong to mars you are not belong to saturn you are belong to earth so if this is your home you will find a way to defend it because we have no option left thank you I, I can go and uh, just to remember uh, and to remind to all the attendees that um, uh, as indigenous people, we have many knowledges, especially in our relationship with our earth in the Andes, for example, we name the earth as Pachamama, that is the mother earth. That is another being. Is not nature, is the mother, is part of the all beings in the Andes. And uh, this pandemic reminds me the importance to maintain a good relationship with, with our Pachamama. It reminds me also to practice what we know and also in our communities in the Andes we practice that is Aini the collaboration, helping each other. This pandemic demonstrated us that uh, this capitalistic system, for example, uh, doesn't pay attention to collaboration, to solidarity. The result is the distribution of the vaccines. Our countries, our poor countries, that's, especially in Peru, we don't know when we we'll finish the vaccination we are expecting that next year we'll have fully vaccinated finishing next year all our population i think the same happened in other countries especially in the global south with a lot of indigenous population in this case latin america and also we are in the within the first countries with more problems during this pandemic so it reminds me that as indigenous people as andrew mentioned we should remind we should pay attention more to our, to our knowledge yes we are educated in a western uh, education system our education is uh, more in how is the western uh, episteme uh, the western uh, uh, culture but also as indigenous people we have our knowledge from our people from our ancestors from our lands from our territories you sh we should pay attention also to those knowledges in the andes uh, we for as i mentioned we we believe in that the most important thing is a good relationship between man humans and the mother earth thank you Victoria, just checking with you if there's anything you want to add as we close out. <laughs> All right, well then, um, I just want to say on behalf of Kelly, Susanna, myself, uh, folks in Fulbright, just thank you panelists. Thank you, Andre, thank you, Hanmani, Dovan, Victoria, for being part of this and being here and being with us. Um, I also want to amplify and elevate Andre and Hanmani, what you mentioned about, you know, I think our work also, for example, as men and get, as myself getting older to amplify the voices of women, of queer and trans folks, of youth in order to be part of this conversation in indigenous groups and, and across our communities. Um, and I also just want to say again, just a huge thank you uh, for being part of this final panel on Unmasking Equalities. Uh, for attendees, thank you all for being here. Just a note that we are going to work on uh, getting this panel posted to our YouTube channel so that you know, folks want to re-listen or share with their networks they can. Uh, we as the Fulbright Diversity Inclusion Coordinators also have a podcast called Fulbright Forward um, that will pop into the chat, if not already, where we continue to explore more dynamics of identity, of oppression, of, of also of organizing and power uh, through these different episodes about how we can continue to move Fulbright forward. So thank you all so much. 
uh, with this, we close the panel, wishing everyone a great day and just to be well and take care. Thank you. Thank you.